ಜನಾಶಲಾಕ್ಷಿಣಮಿಲಿತ್ರಿಪುತ್ರಮತ್ರಾಶ್ರಜಮರುಪುರ ಮಥುರಿಂ ಸಾವತಿ ರಾಧಾ ಕುಂದಂ ಗಿರಿವರಂ ಮಹೋ ಅನಾರ್ಪಿತರಿ ಚಿರತ್ಕರುಣಯಾವತೀರ್ಣಾಕಲು ಮಾರ್ಪಯಿತುನ್ನತಲರಾಶಂಸ್ರಭಕ್ತಿ ಶ್ರಿಯಂ ಹರೀಪುರತ ಸುಂದರ ದ್ಯೋತ್ರಿಪದಂಬಸಂದೀಪಿತ ಸದಾ ಹೃದಯ ಕಂದರೆ ಸ್ಫುರತೋ ವಾ ಸಚ್ಚಿನಂದನ ಅಜಾನಲಂಬಿತ ಭುಜೋ ಕನಕಾವದಾ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನೈಕ ಪಿತರೋ ಕಮಲಾಯತಕ್ಷು ವಿಶ್ವಂಬರೋ ದ್ಯಾವರೋ ಜುಗಧರ್ಮಪಾಲ್ ಒಂದೇ ಜಗತ್ರಕರೋ ಕರುಣಾವತಾರ ವಾದಿನಿ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಸ್ವರೂಪ ಗೌರಂಗಾ ಸುಹೃದಾಯ ಭಕ್ತಶಕ್ತಿ ಪ್ರದನಾಯ ಗದಾಧರ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತೆ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದಿನಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪೀಕ ಕಂತರಾಧ ಕಂತ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ರಾಧೆ ಬೃಂದವನಾಧೀಶೆ ಕರುಣಮೃತ ವಾಹಿನಿ ಕೃಪಾಯ ನಿಜ ಪಾದಬ್ಜಾದಶನ್ಮಯಂ ಪ್ರದೀಯ ಭಕ್ತ ಬಿಹಿನಾಪರಾಧಲಕ್ಷಾ ಕ್ಷಿಪ್ತಾಕಮಾಧಿತರಂಗಮಾಧೆ ಕೃಪಮಯ ತ್ವಂ ಶರಣ ಕೃಪಾನ ಬೃಂದೇ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರಣಾರವಿಂದ ಬೃಂದೇ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಚರಣಾರವಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀಲ ಗುರುದೇವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗ್ರಂಥರಾ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋಪಿ ಗೀತ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಪ್ರಮಾನಂದ ಹರಿವೋ ಸೊ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಆನರ್ ಮೈ ಫಾರ್ಚುನ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ಲೇಷರ್ ಟು ಟು ಬಿ ಅಗೇನ್ ಟುಡೇ ಒನ್ ಮೋರ್ ಡೇ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಬೀನ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಎಂಗೇಜ್ in the hari katha and sadhu sangha by the mercy of sri guru vaishnav so that's a very extraordinary event in our daily life with or without confinement so <laughs> so let's let's keep with the extraordinary wave one more time one more day at least so today we are in our second meeting regarding the study of the gopi gita still we are in an introductory section and next week we will start officially with the first verse of the song of the gopis so today in our second class we will see a second part of the introduction that is like building up to the gopi gita in itself but as usual we will make a brief summary of what we were uh discussing yesterday and after that we will go with today's topic so yesterday we started before speaking about gopi gita before speaking about even the rasa panchadhyay or the five chapters connected uh, to the rasa lila gopi gita being one of them we spoke before that about some other gitas if you will some other songs that we find apart from the f- most famous bhagavad gita in the bhagavad which is a song in itself but which includes at the same time many songs you know, like as we spoke more secondary if you will songs like the rudra gita mahishi gita udhav gita inside the udhav gita bhikshu gita ila gita and also at the end in the 12th canto the bhumi gita so we mentioned those six but also we mentioned another six songs which had to do with the 10th canto of the bhagavat the braja section 
and all of them being sung by the gopis, all of them being in themselves gopi gitas, if, if you will, because the gopis sang them. So we very briefly mention all of them. I'm just reminding you the names, <laughs> which were Benu Gita, Pranaya Gita, of course, Gopi Gita, Jugal Gita, Bihar Gita, and Brahmar Gita. I won't enter into the details of each. I did that yesterday. So after mentioning this brief idea of the different songs, we, end, we started with the introduction hmm, to, to what the Gopi Gita is about. Hmm. So we spoke about this Venu Gita, chapter 21, 10th Canto, Krishna playing his flute, you know, calling the, the Gopis, sharing some message to them. You know. And after that, eventually he is meeting with those Gopis in the Bastraharana Lila, stealing those clothes. Eventually in the Govardhan Lila, he's given further trailer of what the Rasa Lila will be about by giving uninterrupted darshan for a week. Hmm? So eventually we arrive to the section of the Rasa Pancha Adhyaya, or these five chapters, hmm, which constitute the essence, if you will, of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Hmm? The Rasa Lila, hmm? the whole Bhagavatam building into this direction, the first nine cantos go in there. And after finishing this section, there are two and a half or more remaining cantos, like reflecting back on the significance of this particular section and so on. Mainly speaking, of course, there are so many important sections. There are so many, as Guru Mahesh will say, centers of the Bhagavad around which different emotions revolve. No? Like the hmm? Damodar Lila and Batsalya Rasa, Brahma Vimohan Lila, Sakya Rasa, and of course, Rasa Lila more connected to Madhurya Rasa. Hmm? Which is an important emotion for those who are after what Mahaprabhu mainly came to give. Manjari Bab, or for those who are also after what Nityananda Prabhu somehow or other was giving also in a very interesting current called Priyanar Masakya mainly. So in those in these two, I mean the position of romantic love has a very significant role to play. So it's important whether we have one affinity or the other, whether we have no affinity at all <laughs> to any of these, to, to build our affinity in one direction or the other, but understanding very properly this most important section of the Bhagavad. So these five chapters of the Rasa Lila are also called the five prams, the five life errors of the whole Bhagavad. So the description, we started to describe chapter 29th, which is the first of the five chapters of the Rasa Lila. Yesterday we spoke mainly about the 29th chapter. Today we will speak about the chapter number 30, and Gopi Gita will chapter 31. So the beginning of the 29th chapter is describing Krishna and taking full shelter of yoga maya and receiving different udipanas or stimulants that inspire him to play his flute in a particular way. You know, he saw the full moonlight you know, at the same time with reddened face, which reminded him the, the, the golden face of Sri Radha and the red reminded him of her anurag or affection. It was the autumn season, Sarat Purnim, full moon, Vrindavan forest. So it was the perfect stage hmm, for transcendental romantic affairs. So Krishna stands in Tribanga Lalita, hmm, curved in three post parts under Bamsi Bhatt, and he played his flute, invoking the Kama Beach, hmm, and sending like a remote control missile to the hearts of the gopis. Only them were able to hear Krishna's call. And in, the, in that sound of the flute, the gopis were hearing Krishna's, pitifully asking them for mercy, please come and save my life in separation from you. So the gopis immediately left everything behind in one second, only with the sound of the flute, they were able to be detached from everything and ev anything and everything. <laughs> and they arrived towards Krishna eventually, except for some gopis, as we mentioned, that were trapped at home, which signified that they need some further, uh, if you will, mercy to come, which eventually came and they were able to eventually join him. So the gopis arrived to Krishna with their uh, out of order beauty, not so much tidy, not as we spoke, because of their ecstasy, they put everything backwards, and Krishna was especially a charm to that. And he was looking especially to Radha. Mm -hmm. So he, start to, he starts to speak to them with double, a dual dialogue, no? like implying you should return to your house, you should go to your husband, you have your sons waiting, the cows nurse to be milked, so many domestic duties there. So he started to preach to them on certain level about Barna Dharma and Patni Dharma, the duty of a wife, on a superficial level. But the Sanskrit lent itself to be interpreted in another way, which 
in, in where Krishna was saying exactly the opposite. So the gopis were already confused by the sound of the flute and now were further confused by these seemingly contradicting words by Sri Krishna. So at one point, on, on, the, on the level of their humility in Prem, they expressed themselves as discouraged and their kajal was like falling, as we say, and like cutting them in two, they're praying to the earth open and so we may enter there. No, we are, not det we are determined not going back to our houses. So if we cannot meet with Krishna and we cannot go back home, we should die. <laughs> so basically they think like this and at this point, the Pranaya Gita starts in this part, which is the song of the equal love of the gopis, where they speak to Krishna and try to explain to him the reasons why they should be with him. No? Meanwhile, Krishna is apparently saying something else. <laughs> so we spoke about this Pranaya, this Prem Pranaya's equality with the beloved. And eventually after this Pranaya Gita, Krishna is defeated, if you will, by this song of the gopis, the Pranaya Gita. So, the first function of Rasa Lila starts, if you will, the first part, as you will see, there are many sections. They start, they start to sing, to dance, there is Swara, Tala, Rag, rhythm, melody, notes. Krishna is dancing, enjoying with the gopis, expanding himself according to some acharyas, not expanding by, according to others and moving like in the speed of fire with one another and every gopi feeling he is with me. No, I'm dancing in the center of the circular dance with Sri Radha. So at that point, it is explained in the Bhagavad, some of the gopis became proud, thinking in their ecstasy, oh, Krishna is only with me. Mm -hmm. So some level of explanation is Krishna disappeared because of this, to, te to teach a lesson about humility, mm -hmm. which is, of course, most important at every level of our practice. And also because another consideration is for the eventual union, separation will make the heart grow fonder, as you know. So that's part of the dynamics of increased union. But actually, in a deeper sense, it is said that Sri Radha left the Rasa dance by seeing this pride in some other gopis. So she left because she wanted that all the gopis, which are an expansion of her own different babs, give pleasure to Krishna. So if there is some uh, like glimpse of pride, that won't be proper for the loving exchange. So she left and Krishna left after he, her. So that's the point where we left yesterday. That's the end of chapter 29. Krishna suddenly disappears from the Rasa arena. So what will happen next? This we will see now in the chapter that we will we see today, which is chapter 30, which is the gopis in search of Krishna. There are 44 verses. We will try to summarize them, of course. Um, so after this next class we will start officially with gopi gita which is the next chapter and so let's start with the narration of this <clears throat> 30th ch chapter of the gopi gita so again krishna is disappearing hmm, from the rasa arena and the gopis hmm, start to run after his disappearance if you will in some direction in some other direction in the, in the madness of separation like a wild a group of, of, of crazy ladies, of mad women <laughs> in the forest. You can imagine the, the situation, no? crying, shouting, running, no? because they have attained Krishna finally, as you see, as we spoke yesterday. For the Nitya Siddha is already there, but for the Sadhana Siddha, after so many lifetimes of practice, they finally attain Krishna. And after obtaining Krishna, Krishna disappears. So you can imagine what must it be to attain Krishna and what must it be to, after attaining Krishna, stop attaining him and he's disappearing? <laughs> so you are just thrown into a, a pool of madness, no? which will increase, of course, the pleasure of the eventual union. So this is a particular situation here. So there are different groups of gopis here, as you may imagine. There are Radha's gopis and Chandrabala's gopis and some other gopis. So in the case of Radha's gopis, they were not able to see her, her Yuteshwari, her leader group. So they were mainly looking for her, not that much for Krishna. But they were looking for Krishna as well because they want Radha and Krishna to be together. Although they were having some suspicion about what may be happening actually. But the other gopis were only searching for Krishna, the ones who were not from Radha's group. So all of them were looking for Krishna, for Radha and Krishna in a mad state. We will see inquiring from different species of the forest, you know, exhibiting different levels of madness. Mm -hmm. Inquiring from the species of the forest, 
imitating Krishna's pastimes and his lila and experimenting what's called tadatmya or identification with the object of love. Now we will unpack this. But three levels of madness are this called. No? Mada, pramada, and unmada. Interestingly, in English, you say mad, crazy. And in Sanskrit, mada, no? craziness and madness. So mada is madness. Pramada means extreme madness. And unmada means complete, absolute madness. So they went through all these different levels of craziness. So first they will exhibit pramada and unmad, and eventually when that high type of madness uh, recedes, if you will, they will exhibit mada, which is ordinary madness, if you will, normal madness in <laughs> Samhara. <laughs> so we will share some words about these different degrees of madness and how the gopis were looking, inquiring here and there and reacting to Krishna's hmm, separation. So uh, in the third verse of this particular chapter, it is said in the Bhagavad that the gopis, since the gopis were so absorbed in thoughts of, of Krishna, their bodies start to imitate his way of moving and smiling, his way of beholding them, his speech, his other distinctive features. Mm -hmm. Deeply immersed in thinking of him and madness by remembering his pastimes, they declare to one another, I'm Krishna. Mm -hmm. An interesting state. Mm -hmm. So the gopis here are exhibiting topmost limits of tasting rasa. And they're exhibiting what we call, as I say, tadatmya. Tadatmya means like identification with the object of love. So they, their own self assume a likeness to Krishna. And they were announcing to each other, I'm Krishna. But interestingly, this is not Maya Bhatt. This is not the mood that we sometimes call Ahangrupashana, which means I worship someone and I want to become the object of my worship. There is a type of plan in that direction. But here in this verse, the word, there is the word priya priyasya, which means they're beloved. So for the gopis, Krishna still was his beloved. They didn't become Krishna because oneness, full oneness impedes as an obstacle for rasa. We need two for rasa. So eventually, this mud passed and it's, you know, it's peak and began to subside. So the gopis began to search for Krishna in a half conscious state. And they started to present different questions hmm, to the environment, asking in, in their way, in the path, to everyone in their path, if they have seen Krishna. And so we're like intensely inquiring about Krishna. Well, that's a very important lesson. As I remember the uh, Chatur Shloki of the Bhagavad, when Krishna speaks to Brahma, you know, in, in, the, in the last verse, he says, Tabadeva jignasyam tattva jignasunatmana. How Krishna says there to Brahma, a person who is searching after Krishna, after the absolute truth, must search and search up for it, up to he, to this, in all circumstance, in all space, in all time, directly and indirectly, in an obsessed, basically, state, you know, looking for him. Parikshit means looking in every direction with eyes in every direction looking, where is the object of my love? And so the gopis are the great example of this. So let's mention some of the different directions into which the gopis were inquiring for her, their, below, her beloved, their beloved. So first the gopis approached three worshipable trees, which are the people tree, the fig tree, and the vanyan tree. And so these three trees are identified with the Hindu trinity, Vishnu with the people tree, Brahma with the fig tree, and Shiva with the banyan tree. Mm -hmm. So they reached them, singing their virtues, singing, praising their glories. And they thought, oh, they are so tall. So most probably they know, they can see where Krishna is now. So due to their generosity that representing the three murti, mm -hmm. they asked for them, be generous to us, the gopis say. But the trees didn't answer. Generally, trees do not speak, in one sense at least. The tree spoke to Mahaprabhu, but that's another thing. <laughs> so the gopis conclude in their psychology, in their mad, half madness, if you will. Well, they are, they are not ladies. They are men. So they are from Krishna's side. So they are not with us. That's why they are not speaking to us and they are not sharing the information we are looking for. So they continue to, to some little bushes, smaller trees, which give some flowers. So they felt all oh, these trees give flowers. So thus they are much more sensitive towards loving affairs. So they will empathize with us much more. 
So the, the, the wind came and moved the, the trees a little bit, these little trees. So the gopis felt, oh, the, the, this bush is saying to us with their head, no, no that they, they do not know where Krishna is. So in this way, they were interpreting all the movements of nature according to their own bhav. Eventually, they go to Tulasi, Srimati Tulasi Maharani Kijai, <laughs> and they conclude, oh, Krishna came through here. Tulasi is here, so Krishna must be here. And so they ask the Tulasi, you are, a, you are a devotee, you are a woman, you are a lady, so you, you know our feelings. So please tell us which is the path that Krishna took. But Tulasi is not answering. So they conclude different things. Maybe she's in Stamba, she's paralyzed in ecstasy because she saw Krishna. Or hmm, she's not answering because she's pride of her position. This Chakravarti Thakur says that. No? She's never separated from the feet of the Lord. Tulus is always there. Hmm? So since she's never separated, she knows nothing about love and separation. That's the feeling that the gopis are going through now. Vipralamba Prem. So Tulas is always with the Lord. She doesn't know separation, so she cannot understand what we are going through. So they continue. <laughs> they go to some other uh, flowers, like jasmine, kadamba, cool flowers, little flowers there. They're asking them, and they feel, no, they are afraid to reveal mm, uh, where Krishna is, because they are afraid of Krishna, our, our, our key co-wife, Tulasi. That's why they are not speaking. So they go to Bumi, to the earth. And they think, oh, wherever Krishna is, he's somewhere on the earth. So she must know. Krishna always always walks on the earth. So she's never separated from him. So maybe she's not, the earth was not speaking, what's not speaking as you may uh, suspect. So she, they go up again thought, no? The earth is always with him, so doesn't understand how his parents, girlfriends, friends, servants are in separation. So we can ask, we cannot ask to the earth where is Krishna because she's always with him. No. So maybe let's ask the earth what austerities she did long time ago to get this good fortune. And the earth was not replying again. So they say, wow, no. She's having her own body marked with the her concerts food because the earth is one of the concerts of Krishna. So she receives the markings of Krishna's feet. Maybe she's intoxicated by pride, and this is why she's not replying to us. So they continue, and they see the wife of the deer, the she-deer. So the deer is walking and constantly turning her head toward back to the gopis, walking and looking back, as if to say, come with me, I will show you. Follow me, and I will show you where Krishna is. So, and the gopis think, oh, in this merciless Vrindavan, she's the only merciful person. So at this point, actually, it is said that Radha's gopis knew very well by now that Krishna was, was with her alone. While other gopis, for example, Chandravali's groups, they remain unaware or maybe still unwilling to admit this, to admit their defeats, if you will. So the gopis are following the door and they happen to lose sight of her at one point. They run very quickly. So they started to cry out at the point, no? why we cannot see the deer, they was, she was showing us the way to Krishna. Mm? So in answer to, to this question, Gopi said maybe Krishna must be somewhere nearby here in the vicinity. Mm? So the deer, maybe she was, was afraid of, of Krishna, mm? so he, because he didn't want Krishna to reveal his presence, he didn't want the, the deer, sorry, to reveal Krishna's presence, so maybe the deer went and hid somewhere. Mm? So they were reasoning in this way again. And at one point, the gopis detect one fragrance that by chance flowed their way. And they repeatedly started to declare in great ecstasy, yes, yes, this is it. No. Hmm. They, they started to conclude what's the meaning of this fragrance. So they reached that conclusion by embracing uh, his girlfriend, Krishna, Krishna's jasmine garland. Hmm was smeared with the kumkum powder of her breast. They were all visualizing this situation in their eyes, mind's eye. No? So the fragrance of all these things are reaching us. No? Kumkum, jasmine. Mm? So they smell the, the aroma of the bodies of the two lovers, if you will. The garland and the kumkum. Mm? So they started to walk in a particular direction. Mm? This is all the search of the gopis. At one point, they found some trees which were like bent. 
in this direction inclined, like offering pranam. So the gopis, they were discussing further clues about Krishna being right there or here. So they saw the trees bending over with abundant you know, fruits, flowers, and, and also they saw modern bees, bees you know, flying around there, around these fruits. And so they felt, oh, and there are some tulsi growths there. So they, the, the, the two lovers must be nearby here. They concluded like this. No? Krishna must be hiding here somewhere, enjoying his pastimes. So let's follow these swarms of bees that are flying in an intoxicated state. So the gopis were moving in an intoxicated state also, like bees, if you will, trying to take the essence of everything. So again, the trees were bent over, were not answering. So the gopis moved close to the trees. There were some like vines, which is, are considered the wives of the trees. So they thought, okay, these creepers, these vines, never never offer their flowers hmm, of their true love to their husbands, even though appearing to embrace them. No, it's, it means that the creepers are embracing the husband, the tree on one part, but their flowers and so on are not for the trees, are for someone else. Hmm. So the gopis conclude very similarly, oh, they are quite familiar with paramour love, parakia. Hmm. They have their husbands, but the flower of their love is being offered to someone else. Hmm. So they felt, oh, they will understand our path. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So they got close to them, they saw them in a particular mood towards the projection of their own bab. They feel, oh, they must be in touch with the nails and fingers of Krishna out of jubilation, their hairs are standing an end. Mm -hmm. Because that will that won't occur only by contacting their husbands. Well, they were just like again, Atmaban Manjate Jagat, projecting their own psyche into the environment. Mm -hmm. So in this way they want the gopis were wandering here and there. Mm -hmm. And in their deep prem and deep humility, they were thinking all of them have so much love for Krishna, much more than us. All of them are serving Krishna. They are projecting their own love to the environment and feeling, oh, this, this creeper has so much love for Krishna. If we will, we'll be able to have such love someday. So that's a symptom of the highest devotee, the topmost humility there. And he, she will feel, everyone is serving Krishna except for me. <laughs> The opposite is happening in the neophyte devotee, which will feel nobody's serving Krishna except for me. <laughs> so, some in between considerations, of course. So, after hmm, all this search, all this in passionate, obsession, and inquiry, hmm, looking here and there in every direction, and after being in one level unsuccessful in their questioning all this flora and fauna, the gopis began to feel a little bit discouraged in their search because they were not finally able to meet with Krishna. So they enter into a particular devotional trance at that moment, and they began to Im imitate hmm, the various pastimes of Krishna. Hmm. So in the midst of searching for Krishna, each one of the gopis started to think, okay, I will take opportunity to make myself appear like Krishna and act out his pastimes. Hmm. Like to... I'd like to give some momentary pleasure to myself hmm? and to these gods here also. So they began to enact different lilas, hmm? beginning with the killing of Putana, from the very beginning of the whole hmm? tenth count, if you will. Krishna being an infant, baby infant, hmm? and one gopi was behaving as Krishna, another gopi was behaving as Putana. And at this point, the Acharyas made one clarification, hmm? because the gopis have a particular bhav, and for them to <clears throat> make tadatmi or full identification with the bhav of Putana, that wouldn't be favorable for them. So how is that one gopi entered fully into the bhav of Putana? So it is understood that at this moment, the Acharya's comment, Jogamaya took the form of another gopi, create some replicas for someone to be Putana. Mm -hmm. Because Putana bhav again is inconsistent with the gopis mood at that particular moment. So the gopis themselves were acting you know, those pastimes in the context of devotional love. So if someone had to be a puttana, a trinabharta, a sakatasur, yoga maya was creating some particular form for, for that role. So eventually the gopis go through many of these lilas, you know, acting even as Krishna Balaram, one gopi as Krishna calling the cows, another one was glorifying him, her, him, <laughs> and so on. So after this particular section, 
I'm sorry if I'm summarizing too much, but I'm trying not to do that, but I'm trying to do that as well. <laughs> I'm in a dilemma what to do. So Sukadev Goswami, after this, he starts to describe how the gopis were totally absorbed, meditating, acting out Krishna's pastimes, enter into unmad, as I say, total madness. So they lost self-awareness and they totally identified with Krishna, Tadatmi, as I say. But not Maya Bhat, not Ahangra Pashana, but a very particular stage of this equal love of Pranaya. So one gopi said to her, don't be afraid of the wind. Say, one gopi, I will save you. No, and she lifts her shawl above her head, like Govardhan. No, I will put Govardhan Lila. No, and they perform all this, the Kaliya Lila, no, extinguishing the forest fire. Mm. So this is a type of madness that appears, of course, especially in the state of separation. Mm. When you immerse so much in the rem rem remembrance of your beloved, and you are so deeply condensedly identified with the object of your affection, in a higher state of self-forgetfulness that it expresses itself into this tadatmya. So they were performing different lilas in this level of madness. And, and interestingly, they ended their different pastimes with Damodar Lila. One gopi was acting as Jesoda and another was acting as Krishna. She was with one garland. No? It seemed like the rope was trying to tie him and so on. So significantly, they ended their imitation, if you will, of Krishna's passion with one in which he was tied up, not conquered by love, because, of course, that was the reality here. So in all this, but the point again, to understand a little bit this, that, that in all this imitation, the gopis tie up or, or, or dominant emotion, permanent feeling towards Krishna as paramours never, was never interrupted. Even though one was Jasoda, another one was Krishna himself. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there was no rasa bas, there was no aesthetic conflict, if you will, no, a proper mixture of malos. So they continued to experience parakya bhav in heightened stages, in madhurya bhakti rasa, even when they were imitating a variety of Krishna's pastimes. So eventually, as this unmad or topmost madness eventually became like subdued, hmm? the gopis' self-identification with Krishna like slackened hmm? and they resumed their identities as gopis, hmm? another level of madness, normal madness if you will. And they at that point became aware of the footprints hmm? of Krishna in the forest. So now we turn to another particular section of this chapter. We have gone through some of these, no, gopis inquiring from nature, going, gopis, imitating Krishna's pastime, full identifying with him now, attaining so-called external consciousness, we want, if we may call that, and seeing Krishna's footprints. So that's an important section. There are different marks of the soles of his feet. There are many of them described in the scriptures. And all of these marks are preserved in Braj. It is say that whenever Krishna leaves his footprints, and all the Brajavasis take care of that to remain as a, a very worshipable piece of the land daily. So they start to follow the footprints at this point. So eventually they found another pair of footprints, a little bit smaller. So they concluded at this point, oh, Krishna left us for some other, for one girl. So they start to ask, who is this girl? Of course, that's a question. <laughs> so of course, only a certain group of gopis were asking this, mainly the Bipaksha gopis, which is not the group that is with Radha. Because the group of Radha, Lalita, Vishagarup, Manjiri, they knew very well those feet. They knew very well those marks, those footprints, those souls, because daily they are worshiping the feet of Sri Radha. So they, are, they were just being very happy to know, oh, Krishna left everyone, all of us, just to be with her, with our Swamini, our mistress. So the gopis, these gopis, Radha Snehadika, the ones who are especially inclined towards Radha, especially, they were very, very happy now. But the other group, gopis like Chandravali, according at least to Bhaktivinoda Thakur, there are different opinions. They quoted one verse, they invoked one, some words that are, it's a famous verse of the Bhagavad at this point, which is Anaya Radhito Nunyam Bhagavam Haridishwaram. And so on. 
This is a famous verse when it's the name of Radha. Is, this is the closest moment when Sukadev reached to mention the name of Radha in the Bhagavad. Here and there, there are many moments where he mentions indirectly or some word that includes the word Radha. But here's the most closest moment. Anaya Radito, Aradito means worship. This, she, there is one gopi, one girl, according to what you know, this Chandraval is speaking, the so-called enemy of Radha, which is not an enemy, as we will see but competition party. So she accepted defeat saying, oh, there's one specific gopi who have worshiped very specially the feet of Krishna to the point that she's with Govinda alone and he has left all of us only for her, basically. So this is Anaya Radito. Aradito, Radito may mean supreme worshiper of or Sri Radha. So Bhakti Thakur concluded, Chandravali was mentioned in this moment here. So it was officially established, no, Sri Krishna is with Sri Mati Radha Thakurani. So after this, many other groups come with different groups of gopis speaking there. Again, there are different groups like rival groups, Vipaksha gopis, neutral group like Tatasta and gopis. We have Suhrit Paksha groups, which are friendly towards Radha, or Swapaksha groups, which are Radha's group, no? Radha's own gopis. So there are different degrees of uh, closeness to Radha or of relationship to her. So according to their own mood, they were mentioned in different verses, mm, observing the different footprints, analyzing them. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> so, for example, how they were analyzing that at one point, they reach a place where they see these footprints a little bit going below the land. Mm. So they conclude that all oh, Krishna here, he was standing with the, no, this way trying to, to give Radha some flower from a tree, which we had to take from a higher place. So at one point, they only see, saw two footprints. So they concluded, oh, and this point that the, the lady lover was tired. So the, he, the Nayaka, the hero, you know, took her on, on, her, on his lap and so on. So at another point, there were flowers on, this, on, the, on the ground. So they concluded, oh, Krishna was picking some flowers to decorate the hair. Of, of, of her beloved, of his beloved, sorry, by, by combing her hair, especially, again, the ones close to Radha, they really knew what was going on because they have this tadatmya with her. They have full identification, especially the manjaris. They're totally identified. What's going on in Radha's heart? They are experiencing that immediately. So that's the point. No? At this moment, Krishna <coughs> actually had taken Radha to a particular place called Sringarbhat in Vrindavan. You can go now in Vrindavan to that place. It's called Sringarbhat. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice place close to the Jamuna, mm -hmm. admin, ad, administered by the devotees from Nityananda Bamsa. Mm -hmm. So Sringar means on one side romantic love, mm -hmm. erotic attraction, but also Sringar means ornamentation and decoration. That's why sometimes when the deities are being dressed or decorated, it's called Sringar. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, these two ideas apply here. The Krishna and Radha were, of course, having a romantic interaction, and Krishna was decorating her. And Krishna sit Radha her. He tried to pacify her by decorating her. So he started to comb, to comb her hair. It is said that Radha's hair is black, very black, like the Jamuna. Jamuna is also one of the names of Jamuna is Krishna, which means black in one point. So they say that Radha's hair was like black, like the Jamuna, and Krishna's hands were blue, you know, like a blue lotus being carried by the waters of the Jamuna while he was trying to comb her hair. In this way, she's, he's combing her hair, decorating, you know, putting some braid, putting some flowers in between. One name of, of Krishna is Kalanidhi, Kalanidhi, which means he's an ocean of arts. In all of arts. He's very expert in all different artistic expressions. So at this point, we have Bhagavan, Sri Krishna's two Bhagavan, Sayam, Bhagavan becoming a servant of his servant, which is the supreme glory, actually, of his position. That, that's the moment he enjoys the most. We should have this very clear in our particular Gudiya Vedanta uh, bias. <laughs> So Krishna is, is worshipping Radha, decorating her, 
massaging her feet, decorating, painting her feet. He's making some ankle bells with flowers. All this connected to the famous section of the Gita Govinda of Jayadev, where at one point he, the idea, the feeling comes to him. Oh, Krishna's turning down, wanting to put Radha's feet on his head. So he feels, oh, this is too much. I cannot speak about this. This must be my speculation. This had never been said before. So he stops writing and goes to have a walk and take some fresh air. <laughs> but eventually, you know, Krishna comes to his house, disguises Jayadev and have lunch at home and, and, and eventually disappears. And Krishna and Jayadev returns later and he sees her wife, his wife uh, eating lunch. He says, why you didn't, you didn't wait for me? He says, what do you say? You came before we had lunch and everything. So he says, what's going on? <laughs> so he goes to his notebook and he sees that it was open and there the line that he was thinking about was written by krishna himself in the form of jayadev devi pada palavam udharam this is the famous line devi pada palavam, palavam udharam which means krishna is praying to, to radha please devi put bless my head with the dust of your lotus feet so the roles are inverted huh, by the force strength of love so Sevya Bhagavan, the one who is served, becomes Sevaka Bhagavan, becomes the servant of his Sevika. He becomes the Sevaka of his Sevika, his lady servant, Sri Radha. So when Sri Mati Radhani sees such a, such a mood in Krishna, going to the floor, he says, oh yes, you are really the Supreme Personality of God. <laughs> you are inclining yourself towards Prem. That was makes Krishna the Supreme Personality of God. He put his head on the floor in the face of the highest prem, Mahabab. Hmm? Narayan cannot do that. Ramachandra cannot do that. Only Krishna is doing that. Hmm? And this is the Krishna we are worshipping. The Krishna who bows his head to the feet of Sri Rad, to the feet of Prem. That's the God we worship. Hmm? A very interesting conception revealed here in the Bhagavad. Hmm? So meanwhile, hmm, going back to the gopis, they were following different clues and different footprints so eventually they are getting close to the place where Sri Radha and Krishna are there. So Krishna starts to hear the gopis you know, approaching. So she, he, he, he hides himself with Radha. Because he, know, he knew different ideas here, different versions. He knew, oh, if the gopis come and see myself only with Radha, they may become jealous of her. And that will be an apparat from, her to, from them towards her. And that everything, all the Rasalita will be over. And these gopis will be over by criticizing her. And Radha at the same time is hearing this, this and she's thinking about her friends who, who will give her life for her, their life for her. Or even she, she was thinking about the rival, rival, rival gopis. Who want, she wanted to share Krishna with all of them. Remember, she organized the whole Rasa Lila for all the gopis being able to satisfy Krishna somehow or other, such a generous hmm? dispensation, if you will. Hmm? Radha is Karuna Mai, hmm? very generous. Hmm? So, of course, sometimes she rather, as in this case, she knows that sometimes she alone can fully satisfy Krishna. Hmm? And sometimes because she knows that, she puts herself in a bold way, in the first position. Hmm? But she knows if some gopi could have pleased Krishna more than myself, I will be the first to push that gopi forward. But it, this was not the case, and that's why Radha was here with Krishna now. Hmm? So Radha is thinking, as you see, in the pleasure of Krishna. Krishna thinking of that now body may offend Sri Radha. So there's a total uh, selfless affair, basically. So Krishna suggests, mm, let's go. But Radha is, let's hide ourselves. So Radha is, at that point, she says, I'm very tired. I cannot walk. Mm, this is mentioned also. Mm. And actually, she did say that by saying that, she attempted to slow Krishna's pace mm, so that the other gopis could reach them. <laughs> Different possibilities. Mm. So Krishna says, okay, I will take you on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. But it is mentioned that after Krishna says that, he suddenly disappears. And she leaps rather like a fish out of water. Mm -hmm. So again, one may ask why. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's analyze some of the different psychological backgrounds in the mind of both Krishna and Radha for this to happen. Mm -hmm. A little through the lens of our acharyas. This is Chakravarti Thakur, for example. Let me <clears throat> read you some words of, from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. 
he mentions in the commentary in his Siddhartha Darshan, he paraphrases in Krishna. So Krishna is thinking like this through Vishwanath. These gopis have perceived the greatness of Radha's good fortune while she's embracing me you know, in union. Now, let the other gopis see the exceptional condition of Radha attains in separation from me. If they were to see her in a moment of separation, the intensity of that separation in contrast to their own will reveal that the depth of her love was greater than all of theirs combined. Let the subterranean fire of Radha's separation from me later ignite the flame of separation in all of them. Then, when Radha has experienced the fullness of both direct union and separation, this sweet mellow of conjugal love, Sringa Ras, will have become complete. When by my expertise I have made Radha feel separation, then after my dispelling all her pain of separation, all the gopis will share the same mood, same mood and I will be able to properly inaugurate the Rasa dance tonight. So, interesting, no? how we got to have a glimpse into the mind of the Absolute and how he think, how he's thinking, all in terms of increasing Rasa, increasing the pleasure of loving exchange. So according to Krishna's standard, Rasa dance, Rasa Lila didn't start yet. It was not so satisfying to him. So he made all these arrangements are being made, and separation is required for that. So that's a very important uh, point o over and over again the role of separation in order to increase the pleasure of the union, in order to, in order to nurture the dynamics mm, of love, union, separation, union, separation. And with every separation, it will come an eventual further union and reaching higher and higher heights mm, of love meeting in love and so on. So according to Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur, these are some of the reasons in Krishna's mind. So let's go now to the psychological backgrounds in Sri Radha's mind regarding what happened at this pre precise moment. So the Bhagavad, if we go to the Bhagavad verses at this point, Bhagavad will say this gopi, is, is not saying Radha overtly, again, indirect language is there. So this gopi, Became, became proud for being the chosen one by Krishna. Mm -hmm. But actually, th that's a general outward reason. Oh, she was proud and Krishna left her because she was proud. She left the gopis because of pride before. But we knew, we, we have known there are some other re further reasons there, subterranean reasons, <laughs> underground meanings. So actually the real explanation, if you will, the deeper one is that Radha, mm -hmm knowing the necessity of her friends, he's, he posed you know, as to be pride externally. You know, she presented himself. There is some truth to that. Externally, she acts in a proud way and saying, Krishna, carry me. I cannot walk further. That's a form of pride. Mm -hmm. So when, but what it says that when she was going to Krishna's shoulders, mm -hmm, it is said that at that moment, some charis comment, she lost sight of Krishna for a second when she was over Krishna's shoulder. <laughs> so at that moment when she lost sight of Krishna, she started to, to manifest extreme symptoms of separation. Mm -hmm. What we know as Prem by Chitya, which means separation in union. Mm -hmm. She was indeed with Krishna. She was being carried by him, <laughs> but she was, she, she lost sight of him for a minute. So she was thrown into an ocean of this particular type of separation called Prem by Chitya. Mm -hmm. So she entered into this overwhelming state, and when Krishna saw this, he was overwhelmed. You know? So he, he thought, I want the gopis who are coming to be to witness this glorious state of Sri Radha, you know? to establish her superiority, the superiority of her love. You know? So they can know the full glory of Radha's love. You know? And as we know, he will do that, and he himself will become increasingly overwhelmed by witnessing the glory of Radha's, the degree of Radha's love in separation to the point that he will want to taste that as Mahaprabhu. That's another thing, we will go further <laughs> eventually. Mm -hmm. So when Krishna is seeing the gopis coming and she has Radha in such a state, Krishna hides himself and he leaves Radha alone there. Mm -hmm. So Krishna is hiding behind a tree, a Tamil tree actually, to say that the Tamil tree has the same color of Krishna's complexion. 
So it was like camouflage. That's the name of Tamal Krishna. Tamal Krishna is one name for Krishna, which has to do with Krishna hidden there and witnessing, as we will see, Gopi Gita. Witnessing the song of the Gopis, witnessing the condition and separation of the Gopis, and developing a very particular desire for tasting that in the form of Sri and Gaur Lila. So Krishna is hiding there. Tamal Krishna is there. He will remain there from here till the end of Gopi Gita when he will reappear. So do not forget where he is <laughs> and who he is. Tamal Krishna now. Tamal Krishna Ki Jai. So he hides there in order to have darshan of Radhasvi Pralamba, Radhasvi Rahas, to see how Radharani's heart flourished in separation, basically. Sometimes it's called Viraha Mahotsav, the great festival of separation. <laughs> so at this moment, she's crying by herself and lamenting in a desperate condition, calling for Krishna, but with a particular intention in mind. He, she's praying to Krishna, oh, I beg you to save my life, oh, my beloved, not for my sake, that's the point, but rather for yours. Remember, Radharani, the gopis, have total self, not self-awareness. They only live, their life is in Krishna's We all see in the Gopi Gita. This is just a trailer to that, an introduction. So, Radha is asking Krishna, save my life, but not for my sake, but for your sake. Because without what we can give to you, we know you won't be fully happy. So that's why we are, that's the only reason why we are calling you to come and help save us. Because as we will see, Krishna needs to be saved by receiving the love of the gopis. So the, rather feeling like this, you, you have given all the gopis and you have brought me only to me, to this secluded place far away from the rest in the forest to enjoy special pleasure with me. So Radha is saying, I know this was your desire. So if I die now in separation from you, you will not be able to find er, like romantic happiness anywhere else. Because I know that that type of joy you are looking, it will be found in me. Mm -hmm. So if you are not able to find that happiness for yourself, I will feel your unhappiness millions of times more than you that what you will feel your own unhappiness so indeed if i ha if i can do something to prevent such pain i'm ready to throw my life away millions and millions of times so that's the, the sacrifice disposition of srimati rather than only thinking in terms of krishna chadhari primanam how to give pleasure to krishna's senses how to satisfy krishna's senses krishna is the topmost sense enjoyer but his senses are totally transcendental and he's totally devoid and bereft of uh, selfishness. So that's perfect, perfect transcendental Sanskrit enjoyment. So the gopis are the perfect counterpart that are ready to satisfy that demand, all-consuming demand, ongoing demand. So Radha is lamenting because she cannot be there to give the proper pleasure because she's about to die for that and she she won't die even in the topmost if the topmost pain is being experienced because she knows if i die krishna will die i won't be able to give him the pleasure he needs i'm lonely living for that she's, she's blinded by transcendental lamentation and she's calling i can see where you are tell me where you are so she's crying and crying and the gopis come there and find that scene the scenario rather throat thrown in the floor, crying in this desperate, pitiful way. Mm. So the gopis come mm, and they found Radha on the floor in extreme lamentation. And it is said that the, the remaining groups from the different, the different group, the, the remaining gopis from different groups did not become jealous by seeing, oh, it was her, the one who came with Krishna, but actually their hearts melted by, by witnessing her condition in this moment. And they realized her superiority as well. Mm. So they took shelter in her. Not only the favorable groups of Gopi, but all of them. The unfavorable, the neutral, Tatashta, Swapaksha, Vipaksha, Suhrit, all of them accepted she's no, the topmost personification of love for Krishna. So this is the nature of, of, of the romantic love, Madhurya Rasa. No? Enmity, enmity and hatred among competitors turns into affection when they all experience the disturbance of separation from Krishna. In other dynamics, there may be some other feelings there. 
but when all of them are suffering for separation of Krishna, all of them are sympathetic to one another. So very different to the so-called love in this world, even the so-called romantic love in this world, that if I love one person, nobody, I, I won't share that love with anyone else in those same terms. <laughs> so we see here a very different example. And nobody was, was jealous from the other. They were just nurturing their own hearts. So for example, Chandravali, who is the main rival Gopi, generally she feels some envy towards Radha in this regard. But when she saw Radhika weeping and rolling on the ground, suffering more than all the other gopis put together, even Chandrabali's heart softened, melted. And of course, Chandrabali, as I say, she's not the enemy of Radha, actually. She has some sympathy for her. Actually, she's like the cousin sister, Srimati Radharani, because their father, Chandrabali's father is Chandrabanu, and Radharani's father is Brishobanu, and Chandrabanu and Brishobanu are brothers. So they are cousins, cousin sisters. So they love each other actually. But there is some rivalry between them in the dynamics of the Madhuri Lila. So eventually Radha started to regain consciousness gradually because, but why mainly? Because of the loud wailing of the other gopis. Now, all the other gopis were surrounding her and crying pitifully in a loud way. And some of them were fanning Radha to put in some cotton here to test he was still alive. So we are trying to make her come back to regain so-called external consciousness. So eventually she returns. So the gopis ask her, no, please tell us what happened. What happened to you? So rather than deep humility, and she expresses herself in topmost humility. Say, oh, Sakis, I have been allowed myself to become separated. How I allowed myself to become separated from you? I'm so foolish. I'm independent. I do not know what's best for me. She's expressing this mood, no? I neglected all of you who have thousands of times more, much more love for Krishna than me. And now I cause you to burn in separation from him and Krishna enjoying, enjoyed with me alone. But all of this was actually his wickedness. Now I'm here thrown by him. So in one way, Radha is exhibiting some so-called enmity towards his lover, her lover, sorry. Humility before the gopis and some like wretchedness towards herself. So again, this has to do with external reason for Krishna's disappear. So somehow or other she was hiding her real bhav here when she expresses herself, uh, wanting them to also dance with Krishna and Rasa Lila. We already explained that. So she rather simply told to them, I became maddened with pride of my good fortune, just as you did before, and now he has left me as well. Again, that's the external reason for Krishna's disappearing and leaving Radha. But she expressed herself humbly in those terms. But again, Radha's deep contemplation was different. Actually, she was feeling, oh, my Sakis have left everything for me. They have no purpose separate other than serve me. And I'm here enjoying Krishna com Krishna's company by myself alone. So this is not fair at all. So I, I will try to arrange for all of them to come and join us rather than Krishna. So we can enjoy all of us together, Rasa. I shouldn't be with Krishna alone. That was her psychology. So in the meantime, she was, the, all the remaining gopis came gradually near and near. And all the gopis were there, the ones who started the Rasa Lila, all reached the spot where Radha was there in the center. So Radha tried to wake up and to walk further, but she was like in a so-called intoxicated state. So with the help of a friend, you know, in anxiety, crying, he took the hand of a friend in support and they began to look for Krishna. Again, some search. And remember, this is full moon night, but the description is that the forest was so dense because of the covering of the trees that it was completely dark. No? It was not full, I mean, if it's full moon, it's full lit, but it was full, fully dark. So instead of running, the gopis here and there looking for Krishna as they did before, the gopis concluded here, here we are in our last verse of this uh, chapter 30, 44th verse. So the gopis concluded, without Krishna's wish, we can never attain him, no matter how much we run. Krishna stated this in the Katupanishad, no jame vaisha brinuteti bala tenalabhya, which means Krishna reveals himself 
only to the person he chooses. And that's an important philosophical point. We see that so many philosophical important points are being stated here for the sadaka. Mm -hmm. Even though this is exhibited by siddhas, by perfected beings in the brush, so many teachings that can be applied in our present stage here. So the gopis say this, and by their behavior, they're establishing this philosophical conclusion. Krishna reveals himself according to his free will. We cannot force him, impose our wish upon him. So the gopi thought, we, will, we won't try to force his appearance here. Even Radha suggested in this context, maybe Krishna is not interested in meeting with them. So if, if that's his, his, his interest, his, he doesn't want to meet them at this time. If we are chasing after him, we will force him to hide from us and go deeper and deeper within the forest without the light of the moon. So we may cause him some inconvenience. That's rather psychology. <laughs> Thus she suggested, better they, let's go to the banks of the Jamuna and let's get together and sing together in praise of him. Where we started, the whole Rasalila started. Let's get together there and long, long for his return. So what's this singing together in the banks of the Yamuna, longing for Krishna's return? This is the Gopi Gita. So let me share before finishing, now this will be a brief summary of chapter number 30 of 10th Canto of the Bhagavad. So let me share some brief words regarding uh, Gopi Gita and, and in connection to this. So the Gopis returned to the bank of the Yamuna, where they had previously associated with Krishna in the beginning of Rasa Lila, and they started Sankirtan together. And again, Krishna is doing all this to churn the gopi's heart. And Krishna will follow them and will hide again, to take darshan of all this. Another Tamal tree, he will be there witnessing. So Tamal Krishna will witness this Viraha Kirtan, Viraha Mahotsav of the gopis, which is called as the Gopi Gita. The song of the gopis sometimes called the song of separation. Mm -hmm. So this Gopi Gita is very important here. Remember, Srimad Bhagavatam is, I mean, the Veda is the topmost revelation. Vedanta is the, uh, the conclusion of the Veda. The Bhagavad is a uh, natural commentary on Vedanta and the cream of the Veda and the ripest fruits of the Vedic tree. And the 10th canto of the Bhagavad is the essence of the Bhagavad. Mm -hmm. And the Braja Lila section is the most important part of the 10th canto. And the Rasa Panchadhyay, the five chapters on the Rasa Lila, are the most important part on the Braja Lila section. The Pancha Pran, five life heirs. And this Gopi Gita is the most important chapter in the Rasa Panchadhyay. So this will be 19 verses that will make the chapter 31 of the 10th canto. So the gopis sat in the Jamuna with a being of one mind, one heart, and they engaged in some kirtan. Sangha kirtan, Sambanda kirtan, Samya kirtan, full kirtan in association. So you've seen, no? Sangha, Satsangha, and kirtan. This is the most important thing to go on with our lives. In our perfection state, the gopis are shown the example, in our not so much perfection state as we may be, it may be our case. The same principle is there, satsanga and kirtan, sadhusanga and kirtan, kirtan. Hmm? So all the commentators mentioned this, now if you sing this Gopi Gita, this will assuage you know, the aggrieved heart of any bhakta who is feeling separation, really, truly feel separation from Krishna. That's the purpose of this whole section. Hmm? So as we will see, just a brief trailer, <clears throat> in this Gopi Gita, they will, the gopis will accuse Krishna and will praise Krishna at the same time in 19 verses. Each one of the verses will be spoken by a different gopi expressing her individual mood. Or also there is the interpretation that all the verses can be applied to the different moods of the different gopis and having different layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. But all of them, the point is, are united in a single purpose, which is meeting Krishna. Pray, crying for Krishna to appear, forcing Krishna to re-manifest by the force of their love in Kirtan. So the gopis in the context of this Gopi Gita will glorify the land of Raj, where Krishna appears, will accuse Krishna for leaving them, at the same time acknowledging his protection before this section. They will express their individual desire for Krishna's blessings. They will glorify Harikata, the ones who spread Harikata. 
they will remember Krishna entering the forest in the morning and returning from the forest in the in the in the afternoon. Mm. Different feelings will be expressed here, no? Their intense separation, which makes a moment like a, a millennium. And eventually they finally will pray for his favor again, for his darshan, weeping loudly till Krishna, as we will see at the end, will return to enliven them and reciprocate accordingly with their love. So this Gopi Gita is sung by, by these very gopis. So the magic of their kirtan is very much praised and, and valued in the Bhagavatam. Udav, when he was leaving Bhagavad, the, the, Raj, the last very, the very last verse that Udav mentioned in his Udav Gita, one of the Udav Gita, the last verse, he said, Bande Nanda Brajasri Nam Padarenum Nabikshna Saya Sam Harikatot Gitam Punati Bhuvanatriyam. I offer my obeisances to the dust of the feet of the ladies of the Kalhar village of Nanda Maharaj. Perpetually, I put my head on the floor to their feet, whose kirtan is totally purifying for the three worlds. And the whole world is being purified by the kirtan of the gopis. And so they, when they chant loudly the glories of Krishna, this vibration purifies the whole multiverse. So that's also our desire. May we be also purified by their song, their Gopi Gita. Parambijayate Sri Krishna Sankirtanam. Supreme glory, Parambijayate Sri Gopi Sankirtanam. To the congregational chanting of the Gopis in this case, no? Sri Gopi Gita. So some words I wanted to share with you today. Some, again, we are creating the momentum to put properly in context this Gopi Gita. So now we are just about to begin with the first verse of Gopi Gita that, that will be seen next week on Monday. So if you have any questions, we have some, some time for that. You have a comment, a couple comments, Mara. A, li a little bit louder, please. Okay, wait a minute. I'll turn that off. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just have um, wanted to say that a um, couple comments that I really am appreciating this because I just, I'm in that, I've been reading this part of the Bhagavatam and I never, um, I didn't remember reading how Radharani is wanting to um, have the Rasa dance for the pleasure of all the gopis. That was her thought. And I really appreciate how you have mentioned that um, Radha and Krishna and all the gopis that they don't have any selfish desires, that their only desire is to um, serve to the fullest each other. That's, they just want to serve. So I really like that. Okay, like nice to hear that. And of course, as you will see, yes, many, many of the things I was saying, and I will be saying in the next <laughs> meeting, are not overtly in the Bhagavad. So many of them, of course, I'm not also uh, creating those stuff from my own imagination, but are revealed by our Purvacharas in the commentaries, with Swami's reading between the lines of each verse. So that's the importance of not approaching the book by ourselves, but reading it through the eyes or the hearts of our guardians. No? So, so many of these intricate details in between the lines are revealed there. And yet, uh -huh. a very important point that you mentioned that over and over to understand the this, this, this selfless nature of the loving exchange between Radha and Krishna. We will continue emphasizing that verse after verse because we need that emphasis because we generally are a little bit out of, uh, out of, the, of that picture and sometimes we may make, misconstrue the loving exchange between Krishna and the gopis as some mundane romantic interaction because it seems so to our eyes overtly. But when you mm -hmm. really approach this narrative by the through the hands or through the lens of our acharyas, you realize this is the topmost example of immaculate self forgetfulness and, and so many things like this. So that's a very powerful thing we will find in this section of the Bhagavad. Very powerful, very a, a great possibility of being, being misled, but if properly understood, will create the exact opposite as, as the last verse of the Rasa Panchadiyai will say that to Vishnu and so on. That by properly going through this Rasa Lila section with faith and with proper guidance, with proper guidance will, one will be able to conquer the uh, disease of the heart, the last. 
the selfish desire. So interestingly, that's the full potential of, of, of the Rasalila, not only to make us conquer last, but develop proper emotions toward Bhagavan. So what else? I have a question, Swami. Yes, Kevin. Um, and this is, uh, it's pretty basic. And uh, after, after the discussion today, uh, maybe uh, I, I actually have a little clarification because of one of the, the terms that you used. Um, and it's, it's coming from an intellectual place, uh, but I hear the words conjugal love used mm -hmm. uh, often in things that I read. And uh, I noticed that this evening in your talk, you actually used the, the phrase uh, romantic love. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that like most dictionaries and my understanding of conjugal relates to a relationship of a married couple, mm -hmm. um, yet neither Radha nor the gopis are married to Krishna. And mm -hmm. so I'm confused and kind of struggling again on the intellectual level to understand how this expression of conjugal love is meant to be mm -hmm. received when it's spoken or referred to, or used to describe uh, this love between Krishna and Radha or between Krishna and the gopis. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, well, of course, first thing, we all try to satisfy our intellects as much as we can, but understanding also that their thirst is unending. So, <laughs> and these narrations are overtly beyond our intellectual reach, but of course there is a level for giving food to the intellect in the context of transcending the intellect in, in itself. So uh, on one side, we can say, yes, the conjugal expression is there. Also, yes, I spoke about romantic love. There are many ways of using that. Of course, the original terms are not in English, are in Sanskrit. And as you may imagine, it's, it's impossible to translate one Sanskrit term into one English word or any other language and be totally accurate regarding the original meaning. And for example, let's go to the example of Saranagati. Saranagati generally is translated as surrender. But Saranagati means Sarana Agati, hmm? to, to, to get close begging for shelter in a voluntary way but generally for us surrender implies in a forceful way i am forced to surrender at least generally in our in this side of the planet no <laughs> so again the, the very word serenagati maybe does not uh convey the, the word surrender sorry does not convey the full implication of serenagati and you have to explain that in many words not in only one so the same with Madhurya rasa or Sringa rasa, which are the original terms in Sanskrit generally refer to this romantic love, erotic. Uh, in, in Greek, actually, we have these terms, no? eros and agape. Uh, so eros mostly, mostly had to do with sexual passion in this world. And agape, mainly with the love of God uh, for man and the love of man for God, but mainly reverential. But here we are finding some type of... <laughs> passionate love for God. No? So it's not mundane passion and it's not reverential love for God, but this is some call of divine lust that actually the term in Sanskrit is adiras or the original topmost feeling for God. So this is a very particular thing because sometimes it said, okay, the gopis have a, a love, love, paramount relationship with Krishna. In this world, that's the lowest thing. And the, the other word is the highest thing. And in this world, the highest thing is Santaras, to have universal compassion for everyone, to be free from selfishness, that's the most noble idea. And in Brindavan, that's the just most primitive, basic stage on which all the other relationships build. No? That's just like I tell you. So sometimes it's not so, so easy to, to fully enter there because we, we tend to compare with this side of the world that is not exactly the same. So some other things in that regard. Um, yes, conjugal has mainly to do with a married couple in our semantics on this side of the planet. And that may be not the best term regarding the implication that it, it has, but at the same time, according to Tatwa or to philosophical conclusion, we could, and this point will be raised after the whole Rasa Panchadhyay, the whole Rasa Lila chapter. Pariksit Maharaj, who is hearing this, 
he's asking something not for himself, he's fully in ecstasy, but for some people in the audience that may misconstrue the whole narration, he asks Sukadev Goswami, oh, how is that Krishna, who is called the Prince of Dharma, was dancing and enjoying with the wives of other men? No? It seems like no? illegal. <laughs> so basically, Sukadev Goswami, what he's saying is, actually, the husbands of the gopis are also married to Krishna. No? Like, in, in, in essence, everyone there is married to Krishna, even though for the sake of Leela, for the sake of the dynamics of the pastime and the intensity of the, and the risk and all these ingredients that are there if you are married to someone else and you have to meet with your beloved with all the different obstacles and all the, that risk increases, no? the absorption and the sacrifice and all many of these elements. But actually, in one sense, in Tattva, in philosophy, all the gopis are married to Krishna. All the gopis belong only to him, if we understand that to be marriage. And even the, their husbands are belonging to him. So in this sense, we, we may find the word conjugal appropriate. And there, there are even some sections in the scripture, for example, in the Gopal Shampoo of Jiva Goswami, he, did, he actually describes uh, Radha and Krishna having a Swakya relationship, not Parakya, eventually, they actually marrying themselves but again, in order to establish this point of tattva or, or philosophical conclusion, it seems Radha belongs to someone else, but actually she only belongs to Krishna. And the same applies to every gopi and every member of Vrindavan, including the so-called husbands of the gopis. There's also Radha Damodar Lila, where in the same way as Yashoda is tying Krishna with the rope, Radha is tying Krishna, her, her, no, her gopi dress, with Krishna's pitambar cloth, like if they're getting married, some secret ceremony being celebrated there. So in many ways we can understand or justify the use of the word conjugal in this sense. <clears throat> but also at the same time, we can say some words regarding the use of the original words, which generally will be sringar. But also it's madhurya. Madhurya actually means sweet or intimate. And the highest level of intimacy, of course, of course, in the, in the realm of romanticism, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the word, or, or erotic, now the word erotic, of course, means much more actually than the, the idea we have, we, we obtain from the English, lex, English lexicon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in English, maybe erotic has to do with our, our, our sexual desire or excitement in that realm. Mm -hmm. But in Sanskrit, again, the words that go, gets, comes closest to having this meaning is the, English, is the word Sringar. So interestingly, Sringar can be translated in many words, in many ways. For example, you can translate Sringar as love, as sexual passion, as desire, enjoyment. And of course, all these meanings are similar to the meaning of uh, erotic in English, if you will. But also there are some other words that speak about this, like Kam or Rati, which carry more meanings that go beyond the realm of the sexual. As we already spoke, rati may mean affection, love, kam may mean desire, and all this in the realm of transcendence. But the very term stringar also actually has to do with, let's say, any peak or projection or lofty object or highest point, acme, hate, or perfection of anything. Now, stringar implies that apex, if you will. So Sringar is considered like the ultimate peak experience among all relationships with the divine. And as a rasa, as a particular type of devotional mellow, it is certainly regarded as the highest, the ultimate rasa, the sweetest one. Of course, as we say many times, not everyone likes sweet that much. And they may be inclined towards other rasas and there's no problem. Subjectively, that the, best, the rasa will be the best for each one. But this Sringar, uh, also, apart from this idea connected to the sexual realm, which, it, which indeed there is, again, I, I, I mentioned this only for a minute, but it may be difficult for us to think in terms of God's having sexual life, but he has, but not as we imagine. <laughs> because that I quoted Guru Maharaj saying when he, they were, someone asking, there is real sex there? And he said, you don't understand. There's no real sex here. There's real sex there but it's not what you think it is. <laughs> For fully understanding this topic, you have to be free from all mundane identification, material 
attachment. And only then you can fully enter into the detailed descriptions of God's sensuality, because they are depicted in some confidential books, but this is not for speaking publicly, openly to anyone and everyone. But that's there, there is intercourse in the transcendental realm, but again, totally free from every scent of selfishness. So that's difficult to imagine because generally in this plane, sexual activity is the most concentrated selfish moment in our lives. <laughs> so to make that same activity exactly the opposite, the biggest offering of the heart, totally selfless, we would need to work a lot before entering into these details. Hmm? So again, the word erotic in English, let me one minute, focuses narrowly on the amorous of sexual only. But the word stringer also means, as I said before, ornamentation, dressing, a dress uh, suitable for amorous purposes, or elegant dress, fine garments, all of this idea of stringer has to do with, of course, also refers to the erotic or the sexual, but at the same time, you know, it moves into the realm of the beautiful, of the decorative. So there's this twofold meaning of stringer, you know, which is to be equated with one another in, in, in one way. Now, the, the erotic, we could say, is the decorative garments within string or ras. No? That, that would be an interesting idea. It's only one aspect of the whole, this whole ras, which implies full decoration, full ornamentation in, the term, in terms of divine love. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the erotic element itself functions as the like, metaphorical vehicle, if you will, to move one to the divine mm, experience in this particular context. Also, something that comes to mind, it's going one for one minute outside of the Bhagavad, is the idea I remember reading Eric Fromm's Art of Love or Art of Loving, I don't know how they call it in English. That's a very nice book where he speaks what's love or what's love not in the beginning, that's intense. <laughs> And he eventually speaks about erotic love, but his idea about erotic love goes beyond the narrow lexical definition. He mainly says that erotic love, if it's love, has one premise, basically. And, uh, I, and he says, the premise is, I love from the essence of my being and experience the other person in the, in the essence of his or her being. So it's interesting. That's his idea of eroticism, and that's interestingly connected to the idea of uh, maduria, of sweetness, of intimacy. Maduria means intimacy. So intimacy, in one point, the highest intimacy has not to do with sexuality; it has to do with relating from soul to soul, from my essence to your essence. Of course, some people may understand the essence of my being as something including the sexual, but not necessarily only that. And for our particular purposes here, essence has to do mainly with the true self, the Atman, the soul and, and all its potential. So in, the, in this context, um, Eric Fromm presents an interesting idea, you know, speaking about erotic love, you know, something that will engage our essence as Atman, as souls, and connects with one person only. But interestingly, he mentions the nature of such connection being from essence to essence is that such love will give rise to a universal love that will like embrace everyone. It will be a universal love. All life, all humanity is connected there. And so something deeper than what is simply related to the sexual platform. So you, you, we see this as an expanded definition of the idea of eroticism. And, and, and that can also give us a new, another way to appreciate the, this erotic dance, this erotic exchange we find it Ras Lila. And also, <clears throat> one last thing, and I'm finishing here, something that comes to my mind as a recommended, a recommended reading, if you will like, for anyone. There's a very nice article, quite long, but it's in a mini book, if you will, but it's called uh, The Erotic Principle and Unalloyed Devotion. Sometimes it is said that it was written by um, Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, but actually, this was written by Professor Nisikanta Sanyal, which was one famous uh, disciple of Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. You know? So he was written with Bhaktisiddhanta's approval, of course. Mm -hmm. But and, and, and this is, as you may imagine from the title, it speaks a lot about this point. You know? Erotic principle 
an analog devotion. So I found here one link. So I'm sharing here a link in the chat section for the ones who would like to, to read that. Read that. <clears throat> Okay, so do we have some other question? Ganga Shakti Dasi has a question in the group chat. Can you see it? <clears throat> How old are the gopis and actually and Krishna actually? Once Guru Maharaj mentioned that Krishna was eleven years old when he killed Kamsa. Mm. Yeah. If I have understood correctly, the gopis are, however, married. So are they older? Sorry for the typing. Very yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is another point that may be overwhelming for some you know, to understand, to realize. Oh, they were. We are speaking about all these things, and when we ask about how old they were, <laughs> you know, they were having below ten years. So you can think how that's possible. And again, that can help us to think more in terms of some form of innocence, if you will. The, of the of the type of innocence we have at that age, seven, eight, nine, ten years, but again at the same time it speaks about how years develop. This is a long, many things to say here, but it is said that both in the case of Krishna and the Gopis, if they have a particular age, actually they are more much mature than one the age apparently shows. You know? So if Krishna is eleven years old, his psyche is much more mature than that. You know? So Rupa Goswami gives this this idea. And the gopis are slightly, generally speaking, of course, all of them do not have the same age, but slightly younger than Krishna. And yes, Guru Maharaj mentioned that Krishna was 11 years old when he left. He left Vrindavan at 11 years old, basically. So he didn't spend that much time in Braj, only 11 years of 125, less than 10% of his life in quantitative terms an external consideration because of course he never left Lips Braj. <laughs> but in qualitative terms, that was, of course, as you know, that created the biggest some scars in his life, if we want to speak in those terms. The first years of your life, <laughs> even though you become a princess in Dwarka, you can never forget your cowherd past for putting that in human terms. <laughs> so so yes, the Rasalila was of course before Krishna living Braj, before some other pastimes also. Mm -hmm. So Krishna uh, is said to have like 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, and she have checked the detail, but approximately she, he was that age. Between, I mean, minimum between seven and between seven and, eight and 10 years, I have to find the detail. But not more than 11, of course. He left Braj as 11. So the gopis, yes, according to the dynamics uh, of yoga maya and according to the social, social dynamics of the lila, they were married very young. If you go to India, not maybe now, but maybe some few decades ago, and even still now in some cases, the girls are married when they are really very young. Well, they may have like five years, six years, and the husband may have 10, 11. Of course, they are married, but they are not yet fully living together and exchanging as a couple, but they already the, the arrangement was made, and she was made with she, he, and so on. And eventually, they go and live together as adults. So in this sense, we find that also the gopis, in the context of the lila, are married, but also there's a whole uh, section about the so-called husbands of the gopis that actually are so-called husbands. It's like appearance of someone being there in order to create the emotion of parakiya. But again, actually, and, and, and prakat lila is one thing, in the aprakat, it takes another form and so on. So basically that will be the idea. And for getting into the details of the particular age, we, we should, and months, because everything is, is detailed. Of course, one thing is the eternal age they have, because that's described in the, in the Aprakat Lila in Golok, they do not get old or younger. They're always staying one particular age, certain number of years, months, and days even. <laughs> but of course in the Prakat Lila, in the earthly Lila, there is a chronology, earthly-like. So they are born and they grow and so on. So of course, this particular Rasalila we are speaking here occurred on earth. So there was a particular timing there when they performed Rasalila, eventually Krishna left Raj and so on. So all this information are, are, is there in the books of the Goswamis in detail. 
but as Guru Maharaj also mentioned many times, is of course you can find about that as much as that helps you to develop the proper mood. But it's not just only about memorizing numbers, months, days, and 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 thinking. I'm no, I know everything about Krishna Lila. Because the Bhagavad itself is not given that information in detail that we may find in Padma Puran, Haribams, and other scriptures. But the Bhagavad itself is trying to convey the feeling no? that Krishna has for the Brajabasi, Brajabasi had for Krishna. So the, the essence of their connection, and that's the most, of course, important thing. But well, some ideas connected to that anyway. So I hope it helps. Uh, so I don't know, any other question before finishing? Okay, so I think we can finish here. So thank you very much for your time, for your presence. And in this case, we will see each other next Monday. And some update for you to know, I finally I will be giving these talks from Monday to Thursday. Today, Friday was an exception, but generally I will be giving the lecture from Monday to Thursday. So I have some time of the remaining days for some other things, some other lectures in Spanish and some other services here. So see you on Sunday for the Swami call and see you on Monday for the first verse of the Gopi Gita. Srila Gurudev ki jai, Sriman Mahaprabhu ki jai, Sri Harinam Sankirtan ki jai, Grantara Sri Bhagavatam ki jai, Sri Gopi ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Gold Brahman and the Haribo, Chakal Pataruga, Shagripas, and Luke, Nanta Koti Vaishnava bring the key, Jai, 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 Jai. The next week class will start at six, and it's going to be a little, the classes are going to be, he's going to try to hold them around one hour, so. Everybody know. Hour and fifteen minutes. <laughs> I'll make my best. I'll make my best. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, we'll look forward to seeing everyone next week. Oh, or Sunday. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. H